Um, welcome back. Uh, we're now going to have a couple of papers uh, on the theme of uh, development archaeology and, uh, within the planning framework. Um, starting off with Francis, um, who's known to many of you, I'm sure. Um, Francis works extensively in the commercial sector, doing um, Paleolithic archaeology, primarily in, in Kent, but with forays um, elsewhere. Um, he was a graduate at the Institute back in, in, in my day, and um, we worked together on many projects. So I'm sure what Francis has to say will be stimulating and um, hopefully controversial. So I'll pass on to, to Francis. Just to remind you, you've got 15 minutes maximum, um, both yourself and uh, David, before we open up the floor to questions. Okay, noting the clock currently says 12 minutes past 12. I'll bear that in mind, Martin, thank you. Um, the eagle-eyed pedants among you, which probably most of you, considering you're mostly academics, will notice that the title is not as billed. It's now Paleolithic Archaeology and the Planning Framework. And that's a bit more, slightly vaguer than the Paleolithic Archaeology and the British Planning Framework, which I was firmly told wasn't allowed because England and Scotland and Wales have got different frameworks. So I did change it to English, but then that didn't filter through. So we've just got now the general planning framework. Um, and what I want, and this isn't the title, none of those titles are what I was initially told to talk about, which I think was the wish there'd just be a, a little bit of light relief to go through a couple of nice commercial projects and admire them. But I'm afraid I wanted to look a bit more under the hood at the curatorial framework under which Paleolithic archaeology is done in a development-led context. And I think that will be productive in the context of today's aims. And hopefully there'll be elements of controversy, which some of which at least Martin might take a particular interest in in due course. Um, I find this very helpful. Many people will think it's bleeding obvious or already know it, but I'd worked in the business for 12 years before Andrew Lawson actually spelt this out. And these are the, and it was very helpful to me, that these are the glossary and cast lists of the people who make the smooth running of the curatorial process work. And these terms have specific roles attached, okay? The, you know, the curators are the people in unitary authorities who fundamentally police the system. It's they decide whether a developer is asked to dig a hole in advance of a development or not. And they decide whether further work is required and its scope. So curators are mostly in unitary authorities who, can, who impose archaeological conditions are absolutely fundamental to what is or isn't done. So that's the curatorial role. And of course, Historic England also has a curatorial role in setting research frameworks and guidelines. Consultants sometimes could be confused with specialists. Their specific role is generally a go between, between developers and curators in terms of, you know, when you're building a supermarket, Sainsbury's don't retain an archeologist. So they hire an archaeological consultant to negotiate with the curators about the scope and scale of work to do. So that's the specific role of a consultant. And then the contractors are generally the people who do the work, the commercial units, and they're generally hired by consultants on behalf of their clients, the developers. And then specialists are lowly people at the very end of the chain who sometimes get involved by the contracting organisations when they feel there's a specialist need that they recognise they don't cover, or it may be that the curatorial authority will recognise there's a need for a particular specialist and dictate that that should happen, or it may even be the consultant themselves will recognise there's a paleolithic, for instance, in this context, need, although of course other specialists are, are, pres are, are out there, and request involvement of a, of a specialist as at some stage in the process. Um, so, creating the historic environment. It, it's not a new problem, and it was first recognised in the later Victorian era and the Shed Monument, the first Shedra Monuments Act, that there was this conflict between development and heritage, which needed some addressing, and as is well known, Pitt Rivers was the first inspector of ancient monuments, and there was a list of 80 castles which should not be built, built over or through by roads. Um, this picture is one of my favourite. This is the A2 being cut in the Swanscombe area in 1906. And if you read the local papers, there's quite a lot of conflict between people being slightly upset about the demolition of ancient woodland and also the remains of 
is it Watling Street, which is that road in Kent, which goes through it. So it was on the radar then. And then if we rapidly fast forward about 60 or 70 years, we have the rescue era of the 1970s, where you had a basically quite an unstructured framework of lots of local groups doing voluntary work, scrabbling around in front of bulldozers, saving quern stones and what have you. And out of that chaotic mess evolved the 1990s, which is an absolutely seminal watershed moment curatorially, where archaeology in general became more integrated into the planning process. And quite surprisingly, this is the lady whose authority this happened under. You might think that the last thing that administration might have wanted was more red tape in terms of archaeology and archaeologists. It's actually PBG 16 of 1990, which dictated that archaeology be a major condition as part of the planning process, was on her watch. Um, and following that, we had a whole series of um, strategic documents and guideline, guidelines which dictated the framework under which um, archaeological conditions are imposed upon development-led archaeology. And then most recently, we have this tome here, which is the current iteration of this framework, which dictates various principles which guide um, curatorial thinking in terms of planning applications. Um, and the key point here, this is all general principles. And as you'll see at the bottom, I think one of my take-home messages is that Pilithic is the same but different. It is guided under the same archaeology, Pilithic work is carried out under the same principles that guide your earthworks and your mosaics. It's all historic environment. And there are some differences of detail, but the same principles apply. And they can just see a general list of the principles, you know, the concept of importance is very important in determining what happens. And there is this presumption of preservation for very important remains. And there's a decision to be made for less important remains, etc. Um, we've been instructed we mustn't read out lists of bullet points. So you can whip out your mobiles and take a quick snapshot, or we can return to that later. Um, but the last point is important, is research frameworks which are negotiated in situations like this about decide, help decide what is important and what our research priorities are as a subject. And then that guides into curatorial thinking about the impact of, of a development on a part of the landscape and what might need to be done to mitigate it in terms of addressing important priorities. So, and just back to the Paleolithic in general, Contrary to the earthworks and the mosaics, there is a fundamental difference in the Paleolithic, is that there aren't earthworks and built things and monuments in that sense. It consists fundamentally of objects found in natural sediments, and that is an important difference which has methodological implications for how we deal with it. So you have flint tools and faunal remains found in these deposits, and interpreting them is the game we play as Paleolithic archaeologists. Um, there's a wide array of supporting evidence, paleontological evidence, which will waft across us, voles teeth, ostracods, insects, that horrible thing, and pollen. And as is well rehearsed and totally correct, it's a very important aspect of Paleolithic archaeology, using this evidence for dating and for landscape and climatic reconstruction, and also for understanding taphonomic processes, because I think one of the differences of Paleolithic archaeology is you've got a wider array of taphonomic depositional processes operating in terms of site formation and you need to unravel that to interpret the human evidence. Um, research frameworks, as I alluded earlier to research frameworks, there's a continuing evolution of research frameworks and so there should be, else we'd still be researching the same priorities as in the 19th century. And I believe, you know, days like this are an important part of evolving research frameworks. But since the 1990s, the, here again, wafting through us is a variety of strategic documents that have guided the practice of palliative archaeology in a development-led context. That is the most recent iteration. Um, right, perfect. Um, so just some hi random highlights of this. In terms of nationally important remains, there's often a big 
dichotomy presented in terms of considering paleolithic evidence of undisturbed primary contact sites like Boxgrove here. Everyone agrees, very important, you know, thorough excavation, mitigation, but they're slightly mythical beasts uh, because even Boxgrove, that landscape there is a palimpsest. It's not one afternoon, although there is very one, one rare horizon of Boxgrove. This is one afternoon, the horse butchery site. But undisturbed primary context is just one of the 1998 criteria for Paleolithic importance. So one has to think about other types of important evidence, how they contribute to research agendas. Um, yes, and you can see, in terms of research agendas in 2008, there's all of those identified themes which are recognised as priorities, and every Part, every Paleolithic site, one has to consider whether the evidence addresses them. So, for instance, the paleo-environmental evidence clearly has an important contextual role in providing the stage on which Paleolithic occupation took place, even if it happens that there's no artefacts at that spot. And, of course, as I was discussing with David Miles at Tea Break, this is the same for other periods. If you've got an Iron Age age deposit with paleo-environmental remains, even if you don't have a wheel whatever barrier, what's they called, chariots, that's it, a chariot bar burial in it. Nonetheless, it's providing important evidence about the context of Iron Age occupation. Um, soon we'll get on to the more controversial bits. Um, so, just some key points. We, this follows on from what other people were saying in the previous session. The, the points about natural, you often as an archaeologist see natural at the bottom of the section. But natural is the natural habitat of the Paleolithic. And we talked about the importance of lurse and uh, rolling heathlands, etc. And I think this is crystallised in a curatorial research framework which I did for south, the southeast region in the deposit-centred approach. The Paleolithic occurs in Pleistocene deposits. So one needs to consider the full range of these deposits and their ev contained evidence to do with understanding the Paleolithic and considering the importance of the remains. I can hear the chair getting restless, so we'll push on to the more controversial bits. So firstly, I thought I'd just present some textbooks, some examples of curatorial practice. And so first we'll get a really example of some really good ones. And then I'm slightly scratching my head on this one. I think rather than showing a wholly blank screen, but I think almost every site you can say or experience I've been involved in you know you can say there are some things which could have been done differently or better but I think this is one of the best not in terms of the archaeology so much although of course I fully defend the archaeology which I think is slightly overlooked in that this is I believe a strong case for occupation of Britain before Linford in that post Ipswichian pre-Linford period which I think is often overlooked but curatorially I think this was good because from the very beginning of the process there was consideration of the Paleolithic potential and it was built in at every stage. So, you know, at some point I said this won't be the cheapest work you've ever done, but it will be, I believe, the best. And Costain, to their credit, said, right, you do what you think is best and this is what we did. So at every stage of the process there was consideration of the Paleolithic special case or needs. And um, Swanson School, I think, is another good one. That was done with Liz Dyson of Kent County Council. And then there's not many others. Now, before I get on to the less exemplary examples, I need to emphasise that I think very good archaeology was done in all of these. But I think there's benefits to be gained from a constructive criticism in a no-blame way of some aspects that could maybe, in retrospect, we could learn from. And I see Helen is in the audience here. And... I emphasise that Helen was the greatest supporter of the elephant site, and I'm very grateful for all the work that was done. But I still think that looking back, and I think the, the project was exemplary. I think in the wider curatorial framework, going back to before Helen's involvement, the elephant site, we could learn from some things which had, could have been done differently. So the Ebsfleet elephants, I expect when I was asked to talk, people thought I'd just ramble on about the elephant again. And it's an excellent site. But uh, I myself am not blameless on this. My very first bit of archaeological specialist work involved in the curatorial process was to make, um, to consider different route options for the rail link through the Ebbsfleet Valley. And as part of that, I prepared a map showing where I thought important deposits and areas of higher potential were. 
And one thing I hadn't learned at that stage was you shouldn't rely on BGS mapping. So I relied on the BGS mapping of the Boyne Hill Terrace, and the area where the elephant was found was just a big white blank of thanet sand. So it was off my radar then, and I think the preparation of that map took that area off the whole curatorial radar for considering archaeological, archaeological impact of the rail link project. And then fast forward, that was 1992 I did that, fast forward to 2003, and you've got whacking great 35 tonners hoiking out large chunks of ground in that area without any consideration that there might be something there. And then there was a, a, a slightly convoluted chain of investigation that ultimately led to the site being recognized as important. And then this exemplary work done there once it had been recognized. One minute. Okay. And it's not just um, that site, many other sites. There's one curatorial gap between areas, red line areas of development outline and um, areas where development impact takes place. But Bully's trying to stop me talking about Harnham. Uh, uh, oh, I, I <laughs> 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 Harnham is another exemplary, another site where exemplary work has been done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joey. But it should be emphasised that this was not found by the smooth running of the curatorial process. It was found because someone accidentally set up a tripod and trod on the hand axe. <laughs> and then someone said, Cri crikey, I don't want to swear like some others, said, crikey, <laughs> some, there's a hand axe, we need to involve some Paleolithic specialists. And then once that step had taken place, I think we conducted an exemplary series of investigations, which led to investigation and publication of this fantastic site, which is a new box grove in many ways. But nonetheless, the curatorial process from the beginning had not run smoothly on that one. Okay, I think, last slide, series of bullet points. Uh, we can ask about research. I'll just make, okay, one point in my remaining minus minute. But people often talk about research. They say, this is research. You can't do research in a development-led framework. But I do think that's particularly pernicious misrepresentation because every time you do any investigation it's research in the sense you're learning something and I think in terms of <coughs> development-led work or even research work you're addressing questions and trying to find data which contributes to answering them and I think that is the business of archaeology and as long as it's directed within the framework of research guidelines and priorities research is not a bad thing and there are many other points there, but I, we can talk about them later in the long half hour of discussion time. Right, thank you, Francis. Thank you for keeping us time. <laughs> We're now going to move on, and um, <coughs> David from um, INRAP is going to give us uh, a talk about the... Um, French experience of uh, Paleolithic um, <coughs> evaluation within the, in the, in the um, context of developer-funded work. Um, David works at INRAP and is, um, the team covers the sort of northern France Picardy area and I think we'll see uh, quite a contrast to some of the things that we've been uh, talking about this morning. So, um, thank you, David. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to Clive and Matt to invite uh, us to show you uh, our uh, work in Northern France. I will not speak about our record and famous record on Northern France. Um, I will not speak uh, also about uh, the planning on uh, the agenda uh, in, uh, in France in general because we, we have to speak in one uh, week, I think, <laughs> to explain it. But uh, I will speak about our methodology we use to detect uh, the politics sites uh, in northern France, and particularly in northern France. So our current uh, methodology comes from a long background uh, coming from uh, the 19th century, uh, but also uh, we have a long experience uh, before uh, the 1970, uh, 1970 uh, with, I called it, uh, gathering archaeology. 
at this time period, we just uh, have uh, a gather information from archaeological uh, sites due to the uh, destroyed. Uh, the site has been destroyed uh, by, uh, for example, uh, these examples, uh, the quarry uh, of uh, clay on gravels and uh, the antiquaries of this time period on the politic specialist of this time period just um, buy the objects coming from uh, the work of uh, the workers uh, of the quarry uh, exploitation. So after, in uh, northern France, we have a, a period around uh, the 70s and the 80s with a safety rescue archaeology uh, for this time period. Uh, the, the sites um, has been not uh, detected before uh, they, they have been destroyed and uh, we have a chance, like uh, for Biash, for example, uh, in, the uh, in the building, uh, one of the workers uh, found many uh, faunal remains and uh, called the Regional Service of Archaeology and allows us to make a brief uh, excavation, but absolutely not a predictive uh, uh, excavation. Uh, we just uh, Alain Turco was just able to uh, excavate a part of the site and the many parts of the site has been destroyed. The first test of preventive archaeology in northern France has been made during the railway uh, TGV North on France. Uh, at this time period, we, we have just a test we have just, uh, I think, 30 uh, test pits made uh, during this uh, railway uh, diagnostic with uh, different techniques uh, used uh, depending on the different actors uh, working on this project. Uh, what is interesting at this time period is to show uh, people uh, go down in the test pits <laughs> um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, so it's uh, t 10 meters deep and they go to, to dig it uh, on the back run. So this old school uh, technique, it's not our technique now. Um, we, um, the archaeologists uh, for this uh, project has been discovered several sites, but only one has been uh, excavated because of a uh, problem of money at uh, this time period also. And uh, they decided just to, to, to make one excavation on a large area uh, and not uh, just a little window on uh, many sites. But it's a choice. It was a choice. Um, the very beginning interesting methodology uh, uh, has been developed uh, during another highway uh, uh, project uh, in the southern Pass on northern France during the A5 uh, 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 fieldwork uh, with a particular technique we, didn't, we don't use now uh, with a trench uh, going to the, uh, to the chalk, to the uh, natural sediment uh, and the secondary and tertiary deposits. Uh, we have a good uh, idea of the stratigraphy with this uh, technique. We also uh, are we also able to, to go uh, on uh, to, to 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 dig and to test uh, the area uh, on the with the security or safety mode. Uh, on the trench, but it's a long time to go, and we don't make all this trench on all the on the track on on the project. So it has been abandoned uh, after this uh, project, and it cost also a lot. A lot. Uh, we have a good example after uh, in uh, 91, 92 for the southern part of a. Uh, uh, 16 on uh, the northern part of A16. Uh, what is interesting, they use the same, uh, absolutely the same technique. It was a geologist, a species of a geologist, uh, Pierre Antoine, which made the test pits uh, with 
approximately the same technique, uh, deep dead spits uh, in the southern part and northern part of uh, the, the highway. And in the southern part, he didn't find uh, any uh, lithic artifact in situ. And uh, the three sites has been discovered during historic uh, diagnostic, historical diagnostic and excavation. And in the other part, the northern part of the, uh, the, the highway, uh, fi 54 uh, deep test pits has been uh, made and he discovered uh, two sites, but only one excavation has been uh, made. It's also a problem, of course. Um, so with the same technique, we have completely different uh, results, depending also with the preservation of uh, the elastic seconds or the uh, Pleistocene uh, deposits in general, and also in the human presence or absence in the, this ter territory. And uh, we made some uh, other tests with pretty, okay with tests, <laughs> with uh, different type of uh, test pits, uh, a pyramid, uh, I can say pyramid, uh, larger pyramid uh, on the, the right, and also we have a terrible accident in uh, in Ansocogel in the 90s with uh, two kill people, and they decided to, to try to have uh, other solutions to, to go down on the test pits. So they tried, but it's completely abandoned. This technique was completely abandoned. I think the first real uh, project with a very high uh, level of planning for archaeology and a really preventive archaeology, as we can uh, say and imagine today, is the highway uh, uh, 29 in the end of the 90s and the beginning of the, the new century. Um, approximately 4,000 uh, deep test pieces has been made on this uh, uh, project, uh, corresponding to 78 days. Uh, 15 sites have been discovered and uh, six excavations has been made. But what is interesting, I want to point here, is the, the choice uh, which has been made there. Here we have uh, in red, uh, in green, sorry, the zone, the area which uh, the pro project goes down uh, to the actual surface. So the part of the place of deposit has been, uh, has been destroyed. Here we have uh, the potential uh, area with geomorphological uh, situation on potential archaeological uh, Pleistocene deposits. And here we have uh, the map of uh, the test pits which have been uh, made on the project. What is interesting, it's okay, uh, some positive test pits have been uh, located to the geomorphological uh, sensitive uh, area, but also we can uh, find here and here some uh, test pits with uh, positive uh, results, but absolutely not uh, detected in the uh, pre diagnostic approach. Yeah, I do. <coughs> so, just a few words about uh, our current uh, methodology uh, and the example of the Canal Center Europe project. We divided our methodology in four times the pre diagnostic, the diagnostic, the excavation, and the uh, post excavation works. So, for the first part, we make a pre diagnostic uh, in, which, uh, in each project uh, for detecting and uh, to, to make an assessment of uh, the previous knowledge uh, accumulated, like here in Catini uh, in the references. And we have also a uh, archaeological map uh, available in, in uh, France in general and we make also a uh, pedestrian prospect for some uh, part of the landscape. And uh, we have a look also to the geological favorable areas uh, using the <coughs> geological map and the other data uh, coming from the BRGM on the ancient, uh, on the oldest uh, excavation or, or test pits. 
after when uh, we make a diagnostic we have three types of uh, teams the first one uh, just uh, have a look to the superficial uh, the historical uh, periods uh, using uh, superficial linear trenches uh, as you can uh, look uh, see it and it corresponds to uh, approximately 10 percent of uh, opening of the area uh, the second team uh, corresponding to uh, the people who are interested in Mesolithic sites and uh, he used uh, trenches and test pits and, and large windows. The third team uh, is uh, just uh, focused on uh, the political occupation using deep test pits I uh, showed you before. And we have uh, this methodology now with all buckets uh, completely digged uh, for each test pit, all the uh, record on the, the different uh, units uh, has been described, and this, uh, all these test pits has been uh, correlated to the synth synthetic uh, stratigraphic uh, sequence of uh, northern France when it's possible to have a primary good idea of uh, uh, the potential uh, dating of the layers uh, and uh, just a few flights, slides to finish. Uh, when we have to compare the results, for example, with the A29 uh, here in red and the uh, CS uh, and the Canal Scenario project now, uh, the Canal Scenario project now is not finished yet. It's approximately uh, 60% 60, 60 uh, made for the diagnostic, but it's I approximately the same uh, uh, long uh, project, so it's, it can be compared. We made uh, in the 19s uh, less uh, test pits, and we discovered uh, probably uh, less sites too, but we don't are exactly in the same position, or we have uh, different uh, less, sec uh, less sequence on different sequence for Pleistocene and it had the, the Pleistocene uh, sequence has been less preserved in this part of the record so uh, we can compare exactly but what is interesting here it's uh, the, this number I think it's uh, the 0 0.06% it's the area we opened uh, in the diagnostic for political archaeology in the canal scenario project. And we find approximately 15% uh, uh, test pits with lithic industry. And uh, this uh, methodology allows us to make a big excavation uh, in a large area, uh, for uh, instance, uh, we uh, digged a uh, free party excavation uh, in this uh, project of Canal Sinara. So, on just a few words to, to finish, uh, two, provoc two provocative uh, uh, questions. Is Northern France not the story's world for Baltic archaeology? Uh, as you dreamed, uh, Becky. Um, no, our methodology is quite okay, but we have also some problems, as, as you can see here. Um, because uh, here is the most density uh, test pits area we have on the Canal Snow project, uh, as you can see, at Avrincourt. We detected here uh, positive test pits, uh, which allows us to, to, to launch uh, the excavation here for the middle Baltic site of Avrincourt. But as you can see here, uh, we have the deep test pits and just close to uh, 50 uh, centimeters, we have a locus of upper politic uh, locus absolutely not detected uh, during uh, the diagnostic. So, okay, we have a good methodology, but not probably for all the, the record. And um, second uh, point uh, I want to launch to is the black hole ecology. I think it's a perspective on future direction because uh, we have a good record, as, as you know, for the uh, early glacial, uh, the interglacial uh, two now uh, of uh, the Pleistocene uh, sequence, but we have a, a hiatus here during the pleniglacial phase, and uh, this black hole of in-settlement dynamics has been to 
has to be test for the for the future. Um, are we uh, have we really a hiatus of uh, human occupation in northern France during this uh, planning action phase, or is it just an artifact of our methodology of uh, of um, yeah of uh, our methodology? And another black hole is a landscape approach. Uh, here we have the example of Avrincourt, Hermi, and the, the two sectors of Avrincourt. We have 400 uh, meters uh, between the two and just uh, two kilometers between Avrincourt and Hermi. We have here in the valley uh, Hermi site with, uh, we have uh, knapping activities. Uh, we have uh, Avrincourt 1 with butchery activities, only very short uh, butchery activities. And here we have just in Avrincourt 2 uh, butchery activities and uh, uh, resharpening activities. Uh, but what uh, and uh, what were they? Uh, what were uh, uh, pre uh, Neanderthals uh, used the area uh, between these sites? It's uh, a good question and probably uh, uh, an opportunity to us to 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 have a. Uh, overall, uh, a wall landscape uh, approach here on this project, and we have to dig all these parts, but it, it has a cost, so we will see. Thank you for your attention. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. Well, thank you, David. Um, Francis, would you like to come up here wherever you are? There you are. Um, uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions now. Um, I've been asked, can people identify themselves when they speak so that um, there's a, um, a, a, a um, that's in the, the, in the record? Um, I've got a couple of points I just might want to throw out for people to think about, one of which was something that Francis picked up, um, picked up on. Um, we don't critique our projects. How many times have we seen you know, the, the site, site reports and we've actually gone back and said, well, you know, in print, this is where it failed. It's not popular, obviously, because somebody's paid for the work and they don't want to be told that it's not, um, you know, it could have been done better, perhaps. So that's something to think about. The other thing I th think that's come out of what a lot of the talks this morning is really what's the basic unit of analysis that, that we're targeting in developer-funded work? Um, it's not the lithics, it's the landscape we're being told. The, the context is important. Now this is, you know, has fundamental implications for what a development control officer um, would ask for, but I think it's something that is coming out of all of these talks and, and um, maybe we need, would like to focus on that. But I don't want to push you down particular um, avenues, so I'll open up the floor now for questioning. Hannah, I think. observation that Molly did through for, for John, I think often innovations and changes in the way that we do archaeology associated with big infrastructure projects. I think we saw um, with Terminal 5 a big change in the way that the commercial archaeological sector took um, on board a lot of academic research questions that were much better than those certainly for the dedicated period. Now the elephant in the room is HS2. So Given that this is a big forthcoming infrastructure project, given what you've learned, Francis, from your decade or so of working in um, commercial archaeology and post excavators, I think given what you've learned from the big infrastructure projects in France, how do each of you go about approaching the Paleolithic at HS2? Um, you go to strike it first? Yeah, by all means, I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> um, Right, I guess it's 25 years almost since my initial bit of work for HS1 in 1992, which I refer to, um, nearly 25 years. How would I approach HS2? Um, writing all this down, <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously my first task, my first thing would be to find a Pathic specialist and pay them huge amounts of money. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I guess it's the, um, the lines on maps Paleolithic potential and character areas thing is to look at the geology, overlay that with the historical environment record of Paleolithic finds with all its warts and flaws, which is something which hasn't been mentioned today, but which has been mentioned on, at similar seminars over the last two years, is that the historical environment record is quite flawed from a Paleolithic point of view and would benefit from a tidying process. But 
obviously that's a big project in itself which cannot be done before HS2 and they say look at the geological mapping look at the character of the geological areas and the records of Paleolithic finds and consider the types of Pleistocene deposit present where they are likely to extend beyond where they're mapped and then consider looking for Paleolithic sites on that basis just off right off the top of my head I know that HS2 probably goes through the Chilterns, which is this upland landscape where you might have occasional brick earth type patches with Worthington Smith type sites. Um, you probably goes through areas of river valleys where there might be Pleistocene terraces, which are very varied. Fluvial Pleistocene fluvial deposits are a very varied character, and you have different sorts of paleothic archaeology within them, maybe concentrations within gravels, maybe fine-grained horizons where you might get less disturbed evidence within build-ups of predominantly gravel deposits. And I think you've also got um, glacial landscapes. I think the Wollstonian, which I know is a whole can of worms, which we won't go into whether what the Wollstonian should be properly called, I think deposits associated with that cold episode might be impacted by HS2 route, I just don't know. But then you might have glacial deposits which might be hiding pyrethic archaeology underneath them in buried channels. So essentially, I suppose, my starting point would be to take the deposit-led approach as characterised in the Southeast Regional Research Framework and apply it to the HS2 footprint. Um, is that helpful? <laughs> I guess that's obviously just the very starting point, and then you get some character areas, and then you look at them more carefully. Um, I think one of the things that, um, David, am I correct in saying that in, in, in France, in your model, you have a team that's dedicated to the Paleolithic and they come in after, after the historical archaeologists and after the sort of Mesolithic archaeologists have been yeah. on. So you're a dedicated team and maybe, you know, a dedicated team to, to HS2. And I think one of the um, strengths of HS1 was an overview of the whole route from a geoarchaeological perspective in an early stage that then dictated packages of work. Now, I think maybe Crossrail didn't work in quite the same way. Sorry if anybody's responsible for that in the audience. Um, but, um, you know, you definitely need an overarching framework, which is what Francis was, was, was saying, for the whole thing. Otherwise, it becomes a piecemeal um, subdivision of, of bits, really, and, and, and I think... Sec, you know, bits of it will be missing then in that case. So that's what I would do and put a team in place to deal with that because it is so specialised. Yes, uh, what we have um, like experience in, in, in France in general, what we have a look to is uh, when we have a region, when we have not this system of uh, dedicated uh, team with politic uh, team uh, uh, dedicated only to a uh, politic and to search uh, and to detect uh, politic uh, archaeology we didn't find any politic sites and just one or two in 10 years so that's our problem in the other region in uh, France in general not in southern south uh, western uh, France because we have a dedicated team but in many uh, parts of France we don't have a dedicated uh, poetic archaeological uh, team and we don't find uh, any uh, poetic sites so yes I think it's uh, one part of the solution yeah. can I just add something to this discussion. Um, question, I've forgotten what it was going to be. The, the first point I was going to make is perhaps to build into the thinking about dealing with the Paleothic archaeology on HS2, the likelihood that unexpected discoveries will be made despite your best efforts beforehand. So to have somehow factor into the big strategic planning, dealing with and budgeting for late and unexpected discoveries, following from the point that the Paleothic resource important parts of it are very rare, so you're very unlikely to be able to adopt an evaluation strategy which will guarantee finding everything important. And the other point I was going to make was the, the late Peter Druitt, who was an influence of mine in the early 80s at the Institute of Archaeology. He created, a, I thought, a brilliantly simple and short overarching research framework for HS1, which I felt that some people were quite critical of, 
So it was a very, very simple and useful approach of landscape zones, periods of potential, and building from that different strategic approaches to investigating those periods. And I thought that was a brilliantly useful piece of work underpinning it from the beginning. Matt, you had a... Just a um, quick question. Uh, team three, how big is team... Oh, sorry. Um, what goes into one of the teams, your, your Paleolithic team? How many members of staff? What kind of range of specialists do you have on call um, to form that team? Uh, it's, it depends on the area, but uh, for Northern France, we, we have uh, two poetic archaeologists. So Johnny Clushed and me now in, in RAP. And we also have uh, two geomorphologists. And we are completely, uh, um, we, we change the wall between uh, the two. So, but uh, in the ideal system, we have uh, uh, one uh, poetic specialist and one geomorph geomorphologist and uh, one technician uh, with us to, to, to make uh, the test pits. That's, uh, the ideal system, I, I, I think, and uh, what we have uh, now in northern France. And, but uh, what is very important uh, to notice also, and uh, the example of the A15 shows us, it's to, to sensibilize uh, Sensibilize to yeah sensibilize uh, also the uh, the historical uh, specialists when they uh, made their trenches they also detect uh, poetic sites or sedimentary uh, deposits of the Pleistocene and they are the first uh, in our system uh, people uh, they uh, they go to to the field and they can uh, also uh, give us uh, many information for the uh, after. Uh, for the intervention of the third, third team fired uh, poetic team. So, yes, we have m discovered many sites also thanks to the archaeologists and thanks to the historical archaeologists. So that's uh, another point. Nick, at the back there. Nick Barton. Danny, I wonder if I could ask you uh, a couple of questions. I'm not sure I understood exactly what you said, but um, I know the planning system is very different in France, but leading on from what Francis said, I mean, is there anything to be learned from your experiences of the unexpected sites coming up so that if at the last minute a new site comes up that was unexpected, were you allowed enough time? Was there enough money and resources available for that? That's number one question. Number two question, I saw you dug some fearsomely deep holes, very scary, but presumably those would be very well below um, anything necessary to be excavated in advance of the, the road that was being put in. So to what extent was this an opportunity uh, that you had, you weren't always able to excavate sites, and was that purely financial that you weren't able to excavate those sites, or was that for other reasons? Uh, the first question was on the uh, unexpected. Ah, yes. Uh, Yeah. Um, did, you, did you get enough time to, to excavate and um, resources? Um, yeah, you mentioned an upper Paleolithic site that came up and um, was not expected in an area. Uh, yes. On one of yes. the last slides, were you able to spend enough time to? Yes. Developers allow you to do this. Yeah, it's it's not uh, just uh, an example. It's uh, it's an example of many uh, many cases. Uh, I think we are very good to, to with these techniques of test pits or regular test pits or of this approximately 50 to 100 meters uh, uh, between two test pits. Uh, we are able to, to detect a persistent place on many more uh, middle poetic places. And, um, but what we, 
what we have in the upper poetic record, it's much more uh, very uh, concentrated area. And uh, in uh, four, six, 10, 20 meters, uh, square meters. And it's very, very difficult to detect it with uh, test pits. And uh, yes, it's uh, a problem, but if we make much more test pits, it's pretty impossible because the cost of uh, this uh, technique in terms uh, of uh, time and money. And uh, so it's a ratio between uh, between uh, the, the time we have, the, the money we have, and the efficient of uh, to, to detect the sites. But effectively, uh, we have some, uh, I think, uh, sites we are not able to detect with this uh, technique. But uh, it's quite different with uh, AG projects like Canal Center Europe with uh, uh, 100 uh, kilometers long and a very, uh, very small project has many uh, buildings uh, around the site, the, the cities or in the cities with uh, just uh, 1,000 uh, meters squares. So we don't have this problem uh, for, for this uh, little area we explored also in diagnostic. So the problem of uh, concentrated areas like uh, upper politic uh, site in a uh, large and huge landscape we have to diagnostic, uh, yes, it's a problem. But I, I have not the solution yet. For the second part of your question, I bet... Uh, unexcavated. Yeah, unexcavated, yeah. yeah. It's another problem uh, of the system and it's completely different in France in, uh, in the system because the regional service uh, of Arcogy decided if if there is or not uh, an excavation, but uh, the law actually, uh, the currently law, uh, allows us just to uh, dig uh, a site which uh, will be destroyed uh, in preventive archaeology. So we have detected many, many, many sites, a long list of sites, uh, but uh, they don't, uh, they will not be destroyed uh, by uh, the building. So we, we didn't have the the, the opportunity to, to dig it in the uh, preventive archaeology uh, framework. Uh, one last question before lunch. Uh, Liz, over there. Um, how do you identify known zones and um, geomorphology? Peak, um, sea surface, and then the geomorphology of the land is there any data in the geomorphology of the land that you decide how many test bits to excavate? Uh, I think you're talking to oh, David. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear your question. Yeah. How do you identify your zones of geomorphology? And ah. how then do you decide how many test bits to excavate? Yes, it's a good question. Um, when we have a look to the background and the historical background of uh, our methodology, uh, when we have the A15 uh, and the A29 and, uh, and so on, uh, we, they decided only to, to, to go on the uh, northeast uh, uh, part, uh, northeast uh, slope deposits uh, uh, in, the, in the landscape. And uh, the problem with this approach of, uh, okay, we have the seek uh, sequence with uh, the seek, uh, seek, uh, seek uh, sequence in the northeast oriented uh, uh, slope deposits. Uh, if we just have a look to, to this uh, slope deposits uh, oriented to, to northeast, we just have uh, early glacial uh, vexillion uh, occupations. And if we uh, proceed like that, we just uh, reinforce the model all the time. And uh, what is interesting also to, to, to talk just a few words about planning, it's uh, in a Canal Center Europe project. A first team of uh, the, the planner of the Canal Center Europe decided to make a map 
uh, with the ideas on the theory of uh, Pierre Antoine, with the northeast model of the symmetric valley, with just thick uh, uh, sequence uh, preserved on the northeast oriented uh, slope deposits. And okay, they said, oh, okay, archaeologists will do just uh, they, uh, the spit on this part, so we will have uh, some days. Uh, uh, I don't know how many, but some days to make uh, this uh, 10 uh, slope deposits oriented northeast on the uh, on the project, and we will have uh, just uh, excavation on this uh, this uh, part of uh, of the project. But uh, when we have a look back now uh, with this data, they proposed to the uh, to the uh, Canal Saint Europe project on the uh, Voie Navigable de France. Um, when we made our test pits, uh, we don't have any early glacial vexillion uh, um, occupations in this, uh, in this uh, area because it's not the symmetric valley system as in the western part uh, of, uh, of uh, the Somme Valley. It's another system. It's uh, all the system with the uh, middle Pleistocene deposits. So, no, we can't make a cop we can't make a copy and paste of <coughs> of systems uh, which has been uh, made on a part of the record, just a part. And we have many exceptions, many more exceptions that uh, really modeled uh, landscape in reality. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, David and Francis. Um, could it, um, we'll Better break for lunch now. Any questions, address them to, to, to these guys during lunch. Um, and I'd just like to thank them both for their um, very uh, informative and interesting presentations. Thank you.